Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Amanda Kramer, and I am the Alumni Engagement Program Manager at the University of Colorado Boulder's LEAD School of Business. Welcome back to our fifth COVID-19 webinar series. These are certainly trying times, and here at CU Boulder, we have gathered our world-renowned faculty to provide frank and timely insights for life during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today is the first of four webinars in this COVID-19 related webinar series. To view upcoming webinars, please visit our website at colorado.edu slash business slash alumni. Click the drop down arrow and click attend online webinars. For today's webinar, we're so excited to welcome professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and fellow of the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Environmental Sciences, Dr. Jose Jimenez, here presenting on the modes of transmission of COVID-19 and how to protect ourselves, what we know now. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Jose, please send a question through the Q&A interface. We will monitor questions as they are submitted and Jose will respond to them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow along with a survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now, I'm excited to introduce today's speaker. A professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Dr. Jose Jimenez specializes in atmospheric chemistry, field measurements, aerosol mass, spectrometry, and advanced instrument development. He holds a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and amongst many accolades, he is the fifth most cited scientist worldwide in the geosciences. Welcome, Jose, and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand the webinar over to you now. Thank you very much, Amanda, and thanks for having me. Um, okay, so um, hopefully everyone can see my screen and can um, hear my voice. Um, so I'm going to talk about the modes of transmission of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, and how to protect ourselves. And I know many of you attended a seminar by my colleague Shelley Miller a couple of months ago, so then hopefully this will be an update uh, with some of what we have learned since then for you. Um, if you want more information, uh, I will highly recommend this link at the end, tinyurl.com frequently asked questions, FAQs, dash aerosol. Basically everything I'm gonna say is there with an explanation and then um, have some other links there as well. Yep. And this is the outline that we'll, I will keep coming back to. First I will explain kind of from a scientific point of view, but it's still um, uh, briefly how can the virus be transmitted. Then I will go on to uh, summarize some evidence that we think that the aerosol transmission is actually major or probably dominant. Uh, I'll briefly um, talk about why the CDC and WHO are so wrong on this on this topic. Sorry to have to say this, but that's the case, and why they are so slow to accept it. And then um, we will go on to what I think most people are interested in, which is how can we protect ourselves and how to think uh, about this. And is uh, there is a lot of things that we can do, but we need to smart about we need to be smart about it. Okay. And then we'll go on to to questions. So without further ado, let me go on to the ways in which the virus can be transmitted. Okay. Um, but we, before that, we need to think a little bit about the size of the virus. Okay. And um, so viruses, and you have here a number of them, they can vary in size. This particular virus is about a tenth of a micron. A micron is a millionth of a meter, right? And you've seen this picture many times. So for scale, if this is the diameter of a human hair, which is 80 microns, the virus is this little dot over here. And it's probably smaller, but if I made it smaller, you couldn't see it. Okay. And um, we often talk about pollution, like all this, all this uh, smoke from the fires, which is not, actually not that different from the virus size. And then we also talk about this like PM2.5, PM10, which is a larger particles, or a grain of sand would be something like 90 microns. So this, this gives you an idea of a scale uh, for these different, these different um, particles, right? And one thing that's a very serious problem in communicating about this is, is that there is a lot of misconceptions about the particles on which the virus is present. Okay? Um, a lot of people talk 
as if the virus basically was alone in the air, maybe with a little bit of water when it comes out of us, but then the water evaporates and you just have the virus floating alone. Um, this is wrong. Okay? And even though it's featured, this picture is actually from the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it's just wrong. Okay? That's not what's going on. Uh, what's going on is more something like this, or what's, what we think is important is that you have particles that are much bigger, that are, for example, coming out of my mouth as I speak, uh, because they're may, may made when I say the T or something like that, some little particles come out, or they're also made in my vocal cords. And they have a few viruses sprinkled in, but most of the particle is water and either saliva or mucin, which is basically what lines up uh, a respiratory tract. Okay? So when, this is important from a practical point of view because we're not trying to defend ourselves against tiny particles that are difficult to filter, but we're trying to defend ourselves against bigger chunk of material that are actually a little easier. Okay. Um, okay. So now that we have explained this, um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about the three modes of transmission, which are, um, so everyone agrees that basically we can get these virus or other respiratory viruses in three ways, what we call droplets, aerosols, and surfaces, right? Uh, sometimes people use different, different names for, for these things, but I'm gonna, these are the ones I, I'm gonna use. You may hear fomites who talk about surfaces, or you may, use, you may hear you know, droplet nuclei or small droplets to talk about aerosols. I'll just use these terms. Okay? Droplets are basically ballistic projectiles. Okay? When I'm talking, you know, there can be some projectile big enough that comes in and lands in my monitor, right? Is the, the best analogy is this Angry Birds game. You know, they, they come in, and if you have a parapet, they kind of stop it. And otherwise, if they hit you on the eyes, on the nostrils, or in the mouth, and they carry the virus, then from them, they can initiate infection. This large or ballistic droplets is, is what CDC and WHO says is dominating infection. This is wrong. I, I'm, I, I and many other scientists are, are sure this is wrong. And these droplets really are only major for situations when someone is coughing or sneezing. So if someone coughs or sneezes towards you, and they basically they score a direct hit on your eyes, then you have a lot of probability they're infected of getting the infection, that's clear. But when we are talking, they're much less important than they thought. And as I will say later, Anthony Fauci has basically accepted as much. Um, the aerosols are different, they're like smoke. They're not projectiles. You know, they're like, like when someone is smoking or vaping and they're coming out of your, of your nose and your, and your mouth and they, they don't fall to the ground, they stay in the air and they dilute, right? And exactly how they behave depends on what's going on. If you're outdoors and it's windy, they go away very quickly. If you're in a closed room that has low ventilation, they will build up, right? And build up and build up and get thicker and thicker smoke over time, right? And this is the way to think about aerosols. And this is the key. If you remember one thing from this presentation, remember, um, they are like a smoke. If I'm worried about the smoke that other people are smoking in this situation, what would I do? That's the most important thing. And then there is transmission through the surfaces. And early on, they told us we have to wash our hands all the time and all that. But it's clear now, I think, to everybody that um, transmission through surfaces, it's, it happens, but it's not major. So we need to keep washing our hands and all that. But that's not the major way in which the virus is transmitted. And, uh, and we have to spend much more time thinking about the air than we, than we should spend thinking about surfaces. Okay. So now some more technical illustration here you have, you know, the ballistic drop, pitching a person in the eye, and then aerosols of different sizes that, that do different things. Maybe I'll, I'll skip more details here because probably too much for this audience. Okay, so I'm, I'm making, uh, this is a strong statement that I think uh, transmission through aerosols uh, is major or dominant and that CDC and WHO is wrong. So I'd like to at least support this um, a little bit uh, since people would be understandably skeptical. Uh, so we're working on a, on a publication with many other scientists about summarizing the evidence. Okay? And these are different lines of evidence that can tell you something about which route may be major or less major. And here we have for droplets and fomites, which is what surfaces and aerosols, right? And a, a green check mark or two means there is evidence or there is a lot of evidence. And an X, a black X means there is no evidence. And a red X means actually there is evidence against. Yeah. 
and there is many reasons. What you see here is the balance of the evidence. These aerosols have many um, lines of evidence that support them. Surfaces have some, droplets have few, and actually have a strong evidence against. Okay? And really the recommendation from CDC and WHO are backwards. They say, this is important, there has no evidence. This is less important, has some evidence. This is not important, which is really what has the most evidence. Let me give you a couple of examples. Okay? So for example, we see that when we go outdoors, it is much, much less likely to get the disease. This doesn't depend on what you believe, it's just an empirical observation, right? There is a database of super spreading events, there is more than a thousand events, and there is one outdoors and more than a thousand indoors, and many other data sets that, that say the same thing, right? This is very easy to explain with aerosols because the, the, you know, this smoke that's coming out of us will, will get diluted much more outdoors. There is always a little more, there's always quite a bit more wind outdoors and indoors, even if we don't feel it very much. And also aerosols rise because the air that we breathe is warm and it rises. In a room, the ceiling is gonna catch it and it's gonna bring it back to us. But outdoors, they, it doesn't and it gets diluted much more, right? So this is easy to explain with aerosols. And I, I have yet to find someone who even bothers to offer an explanation of how ballistic droplets could explain this observation. Okay. Uh, another one is super spreading events. You know, we have written a paper with Professor Miller about the choir case in, in Washington, and they're very easy to explain uh, with aerosols, and they're basically, certainly in the case of the choir, they're impossible to explain in any other way. And you have seen the cases of the, the bus and the restaurant, those are from scientists that we are working with. And there is just a lot of events, and they're easy to explain with aerosols, not possible with the other routes. And there is many other uh, lines of evidence that I could explain explain the whole hour talking about, but but I won't, because that's not what you are interested in for the most part. Um, but uh, there are a lot of myths. So you will hear people uh, talking to the press, scientists who don't believe in aerosols, and they, they will say things like, well, if it's an aerosol, it has to be like missiles, or it has to infect a long range, or you know, and this is this is all wrong. Okay, this is all, all, all wrong and, and there is, um, I will give the Amanda the slides and she will post them. Um, and the, in there you have a link to, to a document I wrote which explains why these are wrong. I didn't, I don't have time to, to go into that. Okay. Um, so let's uh, go a little bit more about the, uh, the core of, 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 this, of this issue. This is what we have been told by WHO and CDC, that this is why social distance helps. Okay? They tell us that there are these ballistic droplets that are coming out of us, and this is from a WHO video where you see the droplets coming out of the person, and then when they are close, it hits uh, the other person, and when they're far, they just land on the surfaces, right? And this is, this is I mean, we know, independent of what you believe about the route of transmission, we know, and we have known for more than a century, that keeping your distance helps with respiratory diseases, right? It helps reduce transmission. And this is how they interpret it. And we, we think mostly this is incorrect. The reason why it helps is, um, the reason why it helps is because um, it reduces the concentration of these aerosols that you breathe. Okay? So this person is, is breathing out these respiratory particles all the time. The smoke is an aerosol and it's just, it's just useful because it lets us see it. And the, these other particles are too too few to see, right? But what you see, you know, is that the smoke is always most concentrated right here. If you are talking to this person right there, you will be breathing a lot of their exhaled breath with little dilution. And if there is virus here, you will breathe a lot of virus, right? That is why keeping your distance reduces transmission for the most part, right? But um, then, if uh, if you are in a room that has low ventilation, you are not safe. Right, because yeah, you are not in front of the person that's smoking or something like that. But over time, the smoke, meaning the virus, will build up and will build up. And you, if you spend there a lot of time, then you can get uh, then you can get infected. Okay? If the droplets were right, you could get infected in this situation, but not in that one. What we see is that you can get infected in both situations. These are all the super spreading events, and that actually is quantitatively consistent when we see one or the other. So I can use evidence for for aerosols and not droplets. Okay. okay, so now I'm gonna switch briefly to why are CDC and WHO so wrong and so slow to accept this. Okay. And again, I could talk for hours about this, but I'll give you a very brief version. So we can look at the, for example, the latest uh, scientific brief of WHO where they talk about these things. 
and they tell us that respiratory droplets are larger than 5 to 10 microns in diameters, whereas um, uh, par particles that are smaller than 5 microns, we call them aerosols, right? And then they go on to describe basically how this transmission, which is what, uh, what they said. So they are saying, you know, if they're larger than 5 to 10 microns, then they're going to fall to the ground and either they hit you in the eye or in the mouth or they fall to the ground, right? And if they are smaller than 5 microns, then they float in the air. Is this correct, right? This is the World Health Organization. You would think they have good experts, right? Uh, well, this is totally wrong. This is actually from the CDC webpage. They have an aerosols 101 tutorial on the occupational medicine branch, not the infectious disease branch, um, about uh, particles settling in still air. So basically what you need to look at here is five microns, which is in between here. So 10 microns will settle in eight minutes. It takes, ten, it takes eight minutes to fall to the ground, while three microns takes more than an hour. For five microns, which is in between, it takes half an hour, right? And really to fall to the ground um, in within one to two meters, you're talking about things that are much larger, 100 microns. And remember we said a human hair is 80 microns. So you're talking about much, much, much larger particles in order for them to fall to the ground. Um, this, this is wrong and it has been wrong for at least three decades. And I'm actually working with historians. We're close to submitting a paper explaining why they got it wrong. I cannot tell you today, but we should be able to tell you very soon. Um, but basically something, what's more important is Dr. Fauci admitted this error a few days ago. Okay? So this is, you can see the video here in the uh, Harvard, he gave a talk. And basically he says, you know, this was just totally wrong. And he learned this from us, Kim Prather and Don Milton, who are working with a group, uh, approached him and talked to him and, and he understood that, that this was wrong, you know, and that CDC is wrong and WHO is wrong. If, it has yet to lead to a change on the guidelines, but hopefully it's a first step. But uh, if you just read this thing, Fauci said, this is, these are his words, bottom line is there is much more aerosol than we thought. And the consequence is that if there is much more aerosol, there is also many fewer droplets. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let's see. And I'm gonna skip over this and over that. Just, uh, just to save time. Um, so how did we end up here? How come that we ended up in a situation in which the WHO and the CDC are so wrong, right? This is pretty shocking and, and indeed is shocking. And you know, and, um, took me a while to even just realize how, how wrong it was, but, but it is, and, and, and there is no, you know, often people online say, oh, there is some conspiracy and they knew and they hid it and it's, it's not that. I, I've talked to a lot of people on the WHO and, and high level people in different places and it is not a conspiracy of any kind. They are genuinely scientifically wrong and confused and there is a reason why that is. Um, and, and we have to go back 150 years or 160 years to understand this in the history, right? So before, you know, in the 1800s and before we had this theory of miasmas, which meant that disease came through the air and, you know, there was this bad air that could come and bring bring disease to you and this was very scary and and you couldn't defend yourself against right uh, in the decade of the 1860s pasteur in france discovers germs okay? and he realizes that and demonstrates that um, for an infectious disease to go from person a to person b the germ has to go from person a to person b either through the air or through the water or through your hands or through food some one way or another, it has to find its way through the physical world from one person to the other, right? And then people with armed with that knowledge start to investigate, okay, for cholera, it goes this way, for uh, the flu, it goes that way, and the evidence accumulates. And you know, but there are competing theories and there is no theory that's well established. Uh, and in 1910, um, Charles Chapin, who was the president of the American Public Health Association, uh, who had been very successful, um, Pre preventing basically transmission in close proximity. Basically, he, he was the one who conceptualized social distance and showed that it worked. So he wrote a book called The Sources and Modes of Infection, which you can find online and highly recommend, very interesting book. Um, and, um, and basically he, so he had said that close proximity, he had realized that close proximity work and he had been very successful in a hospital in Providence that he, he created showing that, that he could really reduce infection a lot by keeping the distance, right? Um, 
And then, so then, but the question was why, right? And he, he tries to explain in this book why. And then there was a German scientist, Fluge, who had measured these droplets. He had put some plates of agar in the floor and then, then someone was talking and then they realized that they, these droplets seemed to fall within one to two meters, right? Um, and they couldn't measure aerosols yet, right? So then um, Chapin has to take a position in this book and then basically he, he hates this miasma theory that was still in the public consciousness because he says pretty much directly, if people think uh, the disease comes through the air, you cannot get them to wash their hands and to keep their distance, right? And he realized that, that washing their hands and keeping their distance did help. So to emphasize that, he says, without evidence, he says that um, the infections in close proximity is due to droplets and aerosol transmission is, is nearly impossible. Okay. And this is wrong, but that's what he said. Okay. And that becomes, that comes at the time in which the, you know, the epidemiology and infectious diseases was ready for a new paradigm perhaps, and, and is very successful and becomes a paradigm, becomes really a dogma that is extends all the way to WHO and the CDC today. That's what they believe. They don't even remember why they believe it in many cases, but that's what they've been told for a century. And that's what they think is going on. These droplets cause infection. And many people are shocked when we challenge that, that, uh, that dogma. Okay. Um, and they, because they come from this, from this paradigm in which aerosol transmission is nearly impossible, they also ask for unbelievable levels of evidence um, for aerosols. You know, I showed you earlier how it is shocking that there is almost no evidence for droplets, but they are taken for granted. And CDC tells us this is the major mode of transmission. And there is a ton of evidence for aerosols, but it's never enough. They always tell us, well, this is never enough. We don't know, we still don't know these details or detail. And that's just, it's just reflective of the bias from which which, in which their minds are framed. Okay. Um, but we are not the first by a long shot to, to point this out. Already in the 1930s, Wells and Riley and others start to, to say, no, no, wait, this is an error. Um, you can transmit respiratory diseases through the air. Um, but they find very, fe very fight first resistance. Okay. And there is only a, a few diseases like measles, chickenpox, and tuberculosis which were described as droplet fomite diseases, droplet surface diseases for many decades. And there are many papers where they, they describe them that way. And there were, you know, for tuberculosis, they say, well, it's a droplet fomite disease, but then there is all these outbreaks in bars and in poorly ventilated rooms and in factories and in ships, you know, that we cannot explain. And it's the same for missiles, missile, the same for chicken pox, the same that we're hearing now, right? There is all this, all these outbreaks like the restaurant, there were outbreaks in choirs for tuberculosis. It's very much the same story, but uh, eventually these diseases are more contagious and through basically a century of work they're demonstrated and finally accepted, right? That, uh, that these diseases go through the air, but these are basically the only ones that have been accepted. So then we end up with a situation now in which a lot of people confuse, you know, the fact that only very contagious diseases have been accepted which is an artifact of history with a law of nature. They tell us that, no, no, if COVID-19 went through the air, it would be highly contagious and everyone on earth would have gotten it, which makes no sense whatsoever. There's no reason that nature only makes ultra contagious cells or diseases. You know, there's, there is actually all kinds of levels of contagiousness. It just hasn't been accepted, right? Yeah. So a little more about how we ended up here. Um, you know, so we end up in a situation, you know, before COVID-19, aerosols have never been considered important from disease transmission. They have accepted missiles and chickenpox, but basically there are very few diseases like that. People are pretty sure there are no more diseases like that. So the people who work on these medical infectious diseases and epidemiology don't know much about aerosols, or know very, very little about aerosols, and they make huge errors like the five micron error. I told you earlier that Fauci has now admitted you know, and this leads, for example, WHO convenes all these committees to study COVID-19. There is no one there who knows about aerosols, right? And this is uh, a tweet from someone who has worked very closely with WHO, did a major study with masks. And he says, you know, I'm yet to have a meeting or even a single email with WHO that includes a single aerosol scientist. So basically, you have a lot of people who are deciding that aerosols are not important. Nobody in the room understands aerosols. No. You know, and the, and the key committee that has decided that it's not aerosols is dominated by hand washing experts, right? Those are the people that, that um, were called in by WHO to make their committee. So 
miraculously, the first thing they recommended against COVID-19 was lots of hand washing. You know, we all had to wash our hands. It's, it's a good idea. It can be transmitted that way. It's just a minor pathway, right? You know, like 16% on that study in the UK. And these people in the committee have published a paper about aerosols and it's just full of errors and misconceptions. I, didn't, I, I don't think I found anything correct, you know? And this is the key committee that's deciding the modes of transmission. And so this is really a bad, bad situation we're in. So. But for now we're on our own until, I mean, we don't know if this submission by Fauci um, is gonna change things, but for now we're on our own. The World Health Organization said, you know, this is from March that it's not in the air, it doesn't transmit through the air. You know, so what we encounter over and over, you know, you have people like me who say, no, no, I'm a, you know, I'm a prestigious scientist, I, I disagree, but people are like, well, if, why doesn't the CDC say this? Why doesn't WHO say that? And this is from one, one of our former students who is now a professor in Texas, and he was saying, you know, I've consulted with many businesses who were interested, but at the end, nobody has done anything because WHO and CDC don't, say this is not important and unfortunately that's the case. If you are here in the seminar, hopefully I'll convince you that this is actually, there's some good chance that they may be wrong and it's not so hard to protect yourself. You may as well protect yourself, right? That's, that's uh, I think what we can hope for until they change the guidelines. Okay. okay, so without further ado, let's talk about what we can do to protect ourselves and to protect others. And again, if you join late, um, this link at the end, tinyurl.com slash frequently asked questions FAQs dash aerosol has everything I'm going to say and, and, and more. Okay. So to prevent transmission, um, basically we have to keep doing everything they've told us. Okay? We have to keep uh, washing our hands. We have to keep wearing a mask. We have to keep the social distance. The reasons why some of these things work are not the ones that we have been told, but we still have to do those things. And we have, in fact, we have to do them better than we have been doing them. Okay? But there is, there is more, okay? which has been discussed, but it hasn't been explained. So therefore it's, it's not, uh, not followed very much. Okay? okay, so then the silver bullet or the almost silver bullet outdoors. Okay? Uh, if you are outdoors distance and with a mask, you know, it's almost completely safe. I'll be, I'll be totally shocked that people get uh, infected in that situation, right? I mean, I wrote that 12 feet, if you're at six feet, it's probably also okay, right? But uh, that, so, so if you wanna be safe, do things outdoors, especially high risk things like singing or, or, or things like that, okay? Um, let me see. Yeah. And people say, well, it's very difficult to do things outdoors, it's gonna be cold, whatever, well, there's been articles, this from the New York Times, and yesterday there was one in the Washington Post about how in 1910 and 1918, during uh, you know, epidemics of tuberculosis or the Spanish flu, um, a school was held outdoors you know, in, in New York and in Boston, in places where it's very cold. And then actually the kids, um, the kids did better being outdoors than they did the, the, being indoors. And uh, so this is definitely doable in Colorado and in many places a lot of the year. So, Basically, the, if you, again, if you learn one thing, do everything outdoors. You know, if you go to a restaurant, go to the, never indoors, go outdoors and keep, keep your distance and you know, wear the, your mask and all that. Okay. So going back to here, but we, we can't avoid going indoors, right? We need to go to the, to the supermarket or to work or to school or whatever. And not everyone is, is willing or able to do things outdoors. So then we have a number of things you have to avoid. And these are, they can be understood in two ways. You can think of every single one of them as you wanna breathe, other, and other people may be breathing out smoke, which is a, a, an analog for the virus containing aerosol. And then this is floating around and you can breathe it in. You wanna breathe as little as possible, right? You can also get this from a mathematical model. Okay? And then the same conclusions come. Okay? And, and we have an acronym or a mnemonic, which is this uh, civic duty, which uh, I, I, I wrote a, an op-ed in Time magazine that you can, if you Google Jimenez Time aerosols, I'm assuming it will come and then you can read uh, more about it. But basically the idea is uh, you wanna avoid or reduce as much as possible crowding indoors, especially if there is low ventilation, especially if there is close proximity, if you cannot keep the distance. If it's a long duration, if people don't have masks, or if people are talking or especially singing and shouting, right? 
the more you have of these things, the more intense, the higher the chance of transmission. Yeah. Of course, this is all modulated by how many infected people are in your region, right? If you're in a place that um, one in a thousand people has the disease and may be contagious, right? And you go to a gathering of 10 people, you have a 1% chance that someone is infected, right? If you go to a gathering of a thousand people, you are approaching a 100% chance that someone is infected in there, right? So, and if you are in a place where, uh, like New York, at the worst of the outbreak, probably one in 50 had, um, had the disease and was contagious of, on the population. So then if you went to a gathering with 10 people, you had a 20% chance that someone was infected, right? So how careful you have to be depends on the state of the disease. Um, you know, that's basically, what's the probability someone is breathing out the smoke where you are? And then if that's happening, this is what you have to avoid, or you have to do the opposite uh, to reduce the, the chance of transmission. Yeah. So I'm gonna give some, some more details. There are, um, there are some posters that someone, someone made, you know, about this, uh, all these actions, which I, 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 you know, I'm not a graphic designer. I, I think I like this, but much better things could be done. You know, if you guys, um, any of you has um, a creative streak, you know, by all means, uh, think about how we could communicate this better. Okay, so then to try to emphasize that indoors is just never totally safe. Okay? We can do things to really mitigate the risk, okay? but it's never totally safe. Okay? So for this, we're gonna use the case of the Skagit choir. So this is, this is now the, for the paper that we have written. In the Skagit choir, about 80 some percent of the people, so 53 out of 61 or something like that, got infected right, in the real event. Now, because we know that was dominated by aerosols and because we, we understand and we have a mathematical model of this, we can say, well, what would have happened if they had done this, if they had done that, right? So let's do that. Let's, let's run the, the choir and change one thing at a time. So let's say now that this was a situation with low ventilation that we increase the ventilation, right? Uh, to a larger, you know, four times as much. So then instead of, you know, 80%, we go down to 50% transmission. Now let's say, no, no, we don't do anything with the ventilation, but we add a, an air cleaner, you know, with a reasonable uh, degree of air cleaning. So again, we go to 50%. Now we say that we are wearing good masks, okay? But we are not, we are not ventilating in the air, we're just doing the choir with masks, okay? We go again to 45%. Now let's say we don't do any of these things, but we just shorten the rehearsal from two and a half hours to half, to half as much an hour and 15 minutes. And again, we go to 40%, right? So you see, people ask me, if I, if I go do this and I wear a mask, am I safe? No, there's no single thing that you do that makes you safe. Okay? I mean, the numbers may vary a little bit, but nothing is safe, nothing makes it safe alone, right? Now, if you start to do many things, what we call these layers of protection. You increase the ventilation and you, and you clean the air and you wear masks and you shorten the duration. Now you go from 80%, 53 people getting sick, to 8%, five people getting sick, okay? This was a pretty extreme event they were singing, which greatly favors the aerosol getting into the air. But you see, kind of, this is what you have to do, okay? And, um, you know, so you could ventilate more, you could open the windows, you could put fans in the windows, you could get, and then this number will come down, but, you know, it's never gonna be zero. Now compare where, with the situation in which we don't do any of these things, we just take the choir and go outdoors, right? And then, you know, I mean, within the precision of the model, nobody gets sick. So again, outdoors is, is just preferable to anything you could, that you can do indoors. Okay? That said, outdoors is not magic. You know, if you're outdoors and you're talking to someone closely without a mask, you can get sick. You need to be outdoors distance and with a mask. That's what's safe. Okay? Or in these cases, because they were keeping, they, were, they will have enough distance, or that's what we are assuming. Okay. okay. So then in these frequently asked questions um, page, there is, um, there's this table uh, that comes from a paper published recently in the British Medical Journal about, about different situations, right? Because you can say, well, the choir, but I'm gonna go do this other thing that's very different, right? So then you have to think about, okay, is there a lot of people or there's few people? Is it outdoors or is it indoors or is it in the indoors and poorly ventilated? Are people silent? Are they talking or are they shouting? Are they wearing masks in a short time or, you know? So basically all these, all these cases that I've told you, basically things that you have, and then the color is the level of risk, right? So if you're silent outdoors and there is few people and, and you're wearing a mask, that's very safe. 
if you're in a poorly ventilated place with a lot of people and people are shouting, you know, you're, you're asking for it, you know, that's a very dangerous situation. Okay. Um, this was, you know, uh, people, uh, this table is not perfect and we're actually writing a paper trying to improve it because some of the colors, but, but I think um, to first order it, it does, it can give, uh, can give you some orientation. Okay, and I'm gonna say in, in the 10 minutes I have before the questions, I'm gonna say just a few more things about some of the important aspects, which are basically the masks and the air cleaning and the ventilation, okay? And, uh, okay. So first of all, again, I, a huge misunderstanding. Masks are not sieves. A mask is not a colander. You know, people have this mental model that, um, you know, the, these are like two fibers in the mask and the particles have to get stuck like if you were trying to pass something through a colander, that's not how the physics works. Okay? Masks work because particles cannot take turns when the air goes around these fibers and they, they hit it, this is called impaction, or, or they touch. Or, you know, very small particles are kind of moving in Brownian motion in the air and then they end up finding um, the fiber of the mask by diffusion or also in, in the weather mask in electrostatic um, in um, N95, or a surgical mask, there is also an, an electrical attraction, right? And this is the reason why those masks become less good over time is because they lose this electrical effect. Okay? So it's, it's generally, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions online where people say, well, uh, the hole in the, in the fibers of the mask is, is this big and the, and the virus is smaller, it will go through. First, most, again, as I told you earlier, the virus is not there naked, it's in a much bigger particle. And second, it doesn't matter that the hole is larger. Masks still work even if the hole is larger. Okay. So then this would be one, one important thing. And there is two links here that explain, there is a really good video uh, by Minute Physics on, on N95 masks that explains this, uh, this very well on YouTube. Okay. Um, now filtering work works, okay? So we, a very good thing that we can do is just open the windows or do something else in which we take the air that's inside and it goes outside, you know, and, and we bring air that doesn't have the virus and we bring it inside, right? Except maybe there is a lot of smoke and, and then we choke ourselves, right? So, uh, but there are places where, because it's a smoky outdoors or because we don't have windows or because, you know, we cannot ventilate enough with outdoor air, we have to use filters, right? And what's a filter? Again, a mask is a filter. A mask is a filter we wear, uh, um, but you can also use them in your HVAC system or you can have basically a box in your living room that plugs in the wall and it's a filter, it has a fan, goes into a filter. And uh, they have a certain, so these are kind of the, the type of filters we use in air conditioning systems and they have what's called the MERF rating. And depending on the rating, you know, they, they work better or worse. Again, what's important to remember is we're trying to filter particles that are a micron or larger. We're not trying to filter, filter the virus here or we're not trying to filter this um, smoke, which is here. We're trying to filter particles that are larger, right? So even filters that are you know, not very good, they're actually pretty good um, for, this, for this problem, okay? And, and there is the HEPA filter that you may hear. A HEPA filter is basically, you cannot distinguish it from the line. Every particle of any size that has the virus or smoke, it will go there and get stuck in the filter. Okay? <clears throat> and this is true for masks as well. A mask is just a filter you wear. Okay? So now for masks, uh, something that's very important that has been lost in this whole confusion with the droplets, right? If you are trying to protect yourself from a projectile, so someone is going to have a projectile that comes to me, what I need is a parapet, a wall, right? And then that will intercept and it can be just hanging in front of my face and it will stop it, right? If you are trying to defend yourself from smoke, a wall won't do it. The smoke will go on the wall, right? So you need a mask to fit snugly around your face, right? And we need to spend effort, you know, basically making sure we don't have any gaps, how someone look, you know, that this fits well on your nose, that you don't have any, um, any gaps in how your mask fits. And also another way to tell is when you breathe in, the mask gets close to your face. When you breathe out, the mask gets farther from your face because there is a force by the air that's going through the mask. If that doesn't happen, that probably means you have gaps somewhere and the air is going through there. Okay. And there is a, this very nice video here that you can also find in YouTube. Uh, which they do a demonstration. Basically, they have this mannequin which is exhaling um, some aerosols, and you see that when they take this mask and they don't fit them well, then basically the aerosol escapes everywhere, right? And this is one of these KN95 masks that you can that you can get, but it's not well fit. They didn't um, 
attach it here on the nose well and you see all this leakage. Now, if you see someone that's wearing a mask that's not fitting well, realize that the curvature of the mask is gonna sell, send all the smoke, all the virus behind them. So the last place you wanna be in this pandemic is behind someone that's wearing a mask that doesn't fit well, because if they are infected, that's where all the virus is going, right? You should rather be in front. Of course, if, if they're covering the nose, if they're not covering their nose, then, then run away. Um, but in, in these videos, well, they show us this, this cloth mask, right? that actually fits well, it's bigger than the other ones. And when you watch in the video, you cannot see any other source coming out. So for, you know, for people, you know, in healthcare or, you know, people who are very high risk, maybe this N95 masks um, make sense. But for most of us, you know, a good cloth mask is, is plenty good. Now, it's also really important that we don't remove our masks when talking. Um, you see routinely, and even Fauci does this, you know, they, they wear wearing their mask and they're indoors and then, they come to talk and they remove their mask. That's a very bad idea. When we talk, we produce, you know, five to 30 times more aerosols than when we are just breathing, right? So you have a room and one person is talking, the person talking is the person that should be wearing the mask. And especially more if we're shouting or we're singing, something like that, you know. If you're in a bar and it's very loud and people have to shout, that's why we have outbreaks in bars, you know, because, they, uh, because of that type of behavior and, and no masks and all that. Okay, so there is, um, and I forgot to put the link, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the slides that I would send to Amanda. In, in John Volkens at Colorado State has a database of masks that they have in testing. And, um, and this is a picture uh, from it. Okay. And this is again the size in microns. And every color here is a different mask. Okay. And what you can see is that they vary all over the place. You know, you have this one, which is probably the worst that basically is taking out 10, 20% of the, um, I think this is a bandana or something like that. And then you have many ones that are in between, but then you have some that are just cloth masks, but they are well built and they actually filter pretty much everything as much as an N95, okay? And they are, but they are not N95. So, so it matters a lot which mask you wear and you wanna wear these ones, right? And you can go to the website and, and um, and see which ones those are. I, this came out recently, so I haven't, I, I wanna buy one of these myself, but I haven't had time to yet to go and see what they are, okay? Um, let's see, and remember the virus is here, right? So, you, so a mask like this is basically gonna remove all the virus if it's well fit. You know, with, well, a mask like this is gonna not do a lot. Okay? Now, air cleaners also work, so I said, you know, um, you have a filter in your, in your ventilation system, something that may look like this, you know, if you have forced air heating and cooling, and you should replace these. We're recommending this MERV 13 grade if, if your system can handle it. But you know, many times that it, maybe there is no ventilation system or it cannot handle it or whatever. So then you can use air cleaners. And there is basically two types, the expensive one that works very well and the cheap one, right? That still works, right? Especially in an emergency like we are. So this is an example of what we call a HEPA air purifier, right? And this is a relatively big one, and you see it has a big price tag, depending on the, how big one you need, it depends on the size of the room, right? This particular one was recommended by Shelley Miller. Um, what is this? This is a box that has a fan, air is sucked into the, into the box, all the, all the virus stays in the filter, and clean air goes outside. This does the same thing, but by attaching a box fan to um, one of these HVAC filters, and if you go to the uh, frequently asked questions, there is a lot of details and links. This costs fifty dollars or forty dollars, and it works very well. It has been shown many times. Okay? So this will be something that basically almost anybody can afford to make any situation safer. Um, in terms of ventilation, and this is where things start to get a little bit technical. And I would, I would, you know, when people say, oh, "How do I know my ventilation is enough?" Um, you need to measure the ventilation and you need to make sure you wanna target these numbers of, you know, at least, you know, at least 10, but if possible, 25 liters of air per second per person, right? We see that in all these outbreaks, they had ventilation of the order of one to three liters per second per person, right? So you wanna have much more ventilation than that. Yeah? Uh, this is from, uh, from Shelley Miller's presentation. Now, Talking less loudly also helps a lot. And this is from a paper from colleagues and they say, that depending on how many decibels you're speaking, this is the chance of, uh, of transmission under different ventilation conditions. So let's just look at this one with low ventilation and you see 
if you are speaking basically at the low end of, of, of uh, typical conversation, maybe you have 5%. If you are talking as loud as, as anyone would talk indoors, you have 40%. So it makes a big difference. Yeah? And you shouldn't let anyone talk to you without a mask, much less talk to you loudly. Yeah? Um, I'm almost out of time, so but just to mention, if you go to this link, can you are, url.com slash COVID estimator, we have a mathematical model where you can calculate things for your situation. Okay? And it has a lot of explanation. I was gonna show it, but I'm, I'm short of time. Okay? And the last thing is that we can use CO2. Um, I think in terms of doing one thing, the, the most practical thing for most people will be to measure CO2. Okay? And you wanna avoid situations to first order where you have more than 800 parts per million. Right? Outdoors, we have 400. Humans breathe out CO2 and breathe out the virus. And well, if you have a lot of CO2 indoors, it means there is a lot of exhaled air from others and therefore there may be virus there. We have written um, a paper on this that is uh, in, a, in a preprint server. I could uh, um, send you a link if anyone is, is interested. That deals with it in more detail. I mean, the details matter, but, but to first order you wanna avoid um, things with high level of CO2. And this is an example now, this is done by a group at Harvard in which they started with a thousand parts per million because they had been breathing in a room. And now they just let, you know, the window is closed in the room. So you see the CO2 goes down, goes down because the air is slowly replaced. You know, so this is at zero and this is after half an hour, you know, the amount of exhaled air has gone down by a factor of two. But this is now when they open the window on the door, right? And suddenly you see the things go down much faster, right? And that in 15 minutes, you basically have ventilated the room, right? But remember, ventilation needs to be continuous. Ventilation is not to open the door 15 minutes in the morning or 15 minutes every hour. It's, it's to keep the window open at all times when you are sharing the air with someone else. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's what I have time to say. So I will we'll go on to answer as many questions um, as possible. Thank you. Um, Great. Thank so you, Jose, and everyone that is on the presentation. And thank you for leaving some room for Q&A. We do have dozens of questions streaming in, so we won't be able to get to everyone. But if you do have a question, please submit it through the Q&A interface. Um, the first question we have here is from Matt. He said, could you share more about indoor conditions that might exacerbate the spread of the virus? For example, should we keep our room at a certain temperature or try to keep the humidity level at a certain level? Um, yeah, so the, again, in this, um, if you go here, we elaborate a lot about temperature and humidity. Um, we don't think, I mean, there is some discussion and it's probably true that having it be a little more humid, so 40 to 60% humidity is better, but I don't think it's worth, unless you already have a humidifier, then you should run it. I don't think it's worth investing on it. I think you should invest on a filter because the filter removes the virus from the air the humidity only makes the virus die a little more slowly. Yeah? And temperature makes very little difference. I mean, we know the cold help, helps the virus, but within the range of indoor temperatures, you know, making your room warmer is, is very unlikely to do a difference because you will have to have the room at 100 degrees to make a, a significant difference. Okay, thank you for that. We're getting this question a lot. Do you think flying on an airplane is safe? Could you tell us more about the filters that they use and if you think it would be safe to fly? Uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, I was going to add a slide about that, but um, uh, for what's worth, and I may be on the cautious, cautious end of things, of, of, of things, I'm not going to fly until I have a vaccine, but you know, that doesn't mean that may, may uh, anyway, that, that may be too cautious, but that's what I've decided. But basically the, the airplane itself, when the engines are running, has very good ventilation, right? And it's ventilation that goes sideways, right? And there is very good filters. They have these HEPA filters and they have a lot of air going, going in there. So basically if you get sick in the airplane, it's gonna be from the person that's sitting next to you when they remove their mask or something like that. So if you can keep your distance and you can always wear your mask, you know, then that's relatively safe. What gets less safe is when you are boarding or deboarding the plane, then the ventilation is not on or there's much less ventilation. And then people see that when they measure the CO2 is much higher, right? So those are riskier times. As is, you know, the, um, forget the boarding, this boarding structure where you walk into the plane also doesn't really have ventilation. 
as well as you know the depending on the airport you know where you're waiting and or the taxi or the bus or whatever those can be high risk situations and the, and the risk accumulates right also i should say when when i say planes are very safe i'm talking about you know a 737 or a 787 these regional planes uh, that you take you know the small plane that you take to go to you know some small town somewhere those are much less well ventilated and would be riskier i don't know we're working with people to quantify how much but i, I would stay away from those and you're gonna fly i would fly with the airlines that um that don't put people on the middle seat because again that's how you could, could get uh, could get infected so i think it was delta and maybe american um i forget that i know it's delta for sure and i would avoid the small planes and i would go only with the big planes okay great that absolutely makes sense. The next question here from Linda, could you summarize the difference between droplets and aerosols? For example, what besides smoke generates an aerosol? Um, so um, smoke from the wildfires, smoke from a cigarette, smoke from vaping, um, pollution, you know, the, the, when you go to the, the Blue Ridge Mountains and you see the, the haze, so when you see the haze here in Denver, those are aerosols, right? They are not falling from the ground. They're not falling to the ground, they're floating in the air, basically. It's the same material, it's just, it's just a ball of, of saliva or something like that. It's just how big it is, you know. Once it gets big enough, you know, like sand, it's gonna just fall to the ground. But when it's small enough, gravity is still trying to get it down, but, but it's too small. And then the motion of the air is gonna keep it aloft, right? So that's basically, that's basically the difference. And, yep. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Mark. He said, is there any evidence of transmission of COVID-19 via ducted air handling systems? For example, from a known room with direct exposure to occupants in a distant room, only explainable by ducted airflow? Um, not that I know of. And I think um, my impression is that, that this is possible, but not very likely. You know, this virus is, is often not so contagious. Uh, not as contagious as the viruses that do that. I, I still think that's possible, but but I don't think that's major. I think that um, it's really when you are sharing a room with others for a long time that we see the super spreading, right? This is, you know, it's the choir. You are two hours in a room with low ventilation singing, you know, or, or a bar where people are shouting whatever with the music for a long time without masks or, or you know, or the restaurant. They were for an hour in a place, you know, is, is more the kind of thing that we see a lot of transmission. Okay, thank you. We're also getting this question a lot, most recently from Julie. In an enclosed room, do ceiling fans make the situation worse? Um, it depends. I mean, uh, you know, if you are smoking in a room, the smoke is gonna mix in the room sooner or later. It may take 10 or 20 minutes, right? So now, if you turn on the fan, you know, if you are next to the person who's smoking, for you it's good because the smoke is diluted. If you are in the other side of the room, that's bad because the smoke gets easier earlier to you than it would otherwise, right? So it depends. I mean, in general, they don't, I mean, I don't know, it depends on the situation, as, as I said. What's useful is to have a fan in the window, you know, pushing her out or, or bringing her in. That's, that's really the best use of, of, of a fan. And again, I should say, you know, if you're at home with people who are in your pod or something, you don't have to be paranoid. The, the virus is not gonna come from the air from a mile away. And it's, no, no, that's, that's, those are the miasmas that, that people hated and why we are in this predicament. You know, it's when you're sharing the room with someone infected you know, in, in the office or in a classroom or whatever. Okay, thank you. Next, we have a question from Bill. He asks, are MERV-13 filters critical to prevent spread of aerosols in recirculated air systems with let's say 10% outside air. I have not heard that aerosols actually build up through a building HVAC system. Um, <clears throat> well, they do, you know, so the <clears throat> this is the theory that I showed. So this is the MERV-13, right? And uh, MERV-13 that's well installed and something like that is filtering a lot of the particles. So, and most systems, you know, have the cheapest filter, which tends to be a MERV-8. Right. So if you go from a MERV-8 to a MERV-13, you're cutting the amount of virus that's going to come back to you. Right. Um, so we think and we recommend that that's a good idea, you know, the, to increase the, the filter you can. MERV-13 is kind of a sweet spot that it is not too expensive. 
it doesn't have too much, it, it still lets the air go through, but it's a much better filter, right? If you go to these ones, they, they start choking the fan too much and they become a problem. And also these are made of the same material that we make in 95, so they are not really available, right? So MERV 13 is where we recommend. Now there are some systems and they call us from a school system and they say, if we put a MERV 13, the fan can't cope, you know, and then they say, we're gonna go with 11 or we're gonna go, you know, so put the best filter you can, um, but, uh, you know, 13 if you can. Don't put a HEPA filter on, on those systems unless it has been designed for a HEPA filter or you will really choke it and, and damage the ventilation system. Okay, great. And taking a look at the time, we'll move into our final two questions. Our next question is um, coming from quite a few people. Could you share your thoughts on upper air ultraviolet purification devices? Mm -hmm. So this is where, where Shelly Miller is the expert, but uh, um, I will say I've learned enough from, from her, her to, to address this. So filtering, when people say, how do we clean the air? Filtering, filtering, filtering. It's easy, it's cheap, get a portable filter, get a, get a fan filter, you know, um, get masks, all this, this kind of thing, this kind of thing. You know, the UV systems are not any cheaper, right? They do work. So it does kill the virus, does, does, does none well, but they are more complicated, they're more expensive. And those light bulbs, they stop working in the UV, but they still make, make visible light. So you have someone that comes with a UV meter to see if they're still working. So they just, we recommend them in, in professional situations. You can have professionals install them in a hospital or in another situation where really is the only thing you can do, then go ahead. And then there is, there is many other air cleaners that work on oxidation and on plasmas or, or even this fogging of disinfectants. Stay away from all that. Filters okay. is what you want. Great, thank you. And our final question again has been submitted by many constituents here. And that is, could you talk about how safe it is to stay in a hotel? And is there a way that we can assess if a hotel is using a well-ventilated system? Um, you have to ask them. I mean, again, a CO2 meter, and I, sorry, I don't have my, my little CO2 meter here, but these are actually quite small and nice, would be a good way to see if there is any recirculation. I, if you have, if you're in a hotel where basically you can open your windows and there is no air coming from other places, that would be a good situation. If if there was a hotel in which for some reason you were getting air from other rooms, that would be that would be riskier. Uh, and there are cases in for SARS, for example, there were cases in hotels. But uh, for example, one of these motels where where you, you basically have your door on your window, those that's, that would be the safest alternative, I would say. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. And thank you again to Jose for this great information. At this time, we invite you to provide your feedback on the webinar by answering the following poll question. On a scale from one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a friend or other CU Boulder alumni? Please take a moment to answer this. We thank you in advance for submitting your feedback. As a reminder, all webinar attendees will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this presentation as well as a survey. To view upcoming webinars as well as previous recordings, please visit our website at colorado.edu slash business slash alumni. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is this Thursday, as Assistant Professor in the Department of Computer Science in the BioFrontiers Institute, Dr. Dan Laramore presents on COVID-19 surveillance testing, a way out, in the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time and go Buffs.